everybody, and thanks for joining our webinar today. My name is Tyler Brunell. I'm the marketing assistant here at Tempo Communications. Uh, and so welcome to Cable Radar, how time and domain reflectometry can help you diagnose trouble or changes on all sorts of cables. We're just moments away from this great content, but first, uh, just a few housekeeping notes. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our website, tempocom.com, in three to five business days. Uh, all attendees are automatically on mute. However, we do invite you to use the chat box throughout this presentation. We'll collect questions as it's going. It is pre-recorded, uh, but Mark is here live with us and he'll be able to answer questions as we go, but we'll probably save most of them for the end. So uh, your presenter today, as I said, is Mark Govier. Mark is the product manager over Tempo's wide range of telecommunications, Wi-Fi, and buried utility market products. Mark is a talented electrical engineer with 30 years of experience in the design and development of Tempo products as a senior engineer and a product manager. So without further ado, take it away, Mark. Hello, everyone. Um, as uh, Tyler says, this is pre-recorded because I have a tendency to speak very fast. <laughs> so uh, I've recorded it, so hopefully the audio will come through very clearly. It also means that when we record the, uh, the final version of it, he can edit in the the original video so it's even clearer so uh yeah let's get started and as, as tyler says if you've got any questions at all tap them into the chat box and uh, i can try and answer some of them as we go if they're very simple ones but the nice and juicy ones we'll keep for the end okay so i'll stop sharing my uh video and my microphone now and i will start the presentation hi i'm mark govia product manager for tempo's wire tracing and location products welcome to one of our fundamental series of webinars. This webinar is targeted at beginners and those who want a refresher on how things actually work and why we do things in certain ways. Today, I'm going to be explaining how we apply fundamental physical principles to locate and identify faults on cables using time domain reflectometry. I will mention the shortcomings of this technique and some subtle variants of the method. I will be starting from the low level fundamentals of why a cable works, which will help you understand why certain techniques can find some conditions and others do not. There will be a live questions and answers section at the end. Please feel free to pose questions in the chat whilst this presentation is underway. I am going to explain why you may want to use a technique like time domain reflectometry. We will use the example of cable TV here, but remember that signals passing along a cable, for whatever reason, are subject to the same or similar conditions and degradation. Speed of reaction to offline customers can be key to customer attention. Keep them happy, and they are likely to just keep paying for your service without question. DOCSIS is a set of specifications created by an industry consortium called Cable Labs and adopted with minor variations worldwide. These specifications have been key to allowing high speed data connections to be established over existing copper cables that are often directly buried in the ground beneath pavements and properties. Hybrid networks have been developed where the trunk connections to the nodes are now made with optical fibers. Then individual properties remain served over their existing copper cables. DOCSIS 3.1 built upon the earlier DOCSIS 3 and uses the same encoding scheme, a single carrier quadrature amplitude modulation. Enough of that, SC QAM. Each channel is either 6 MHz in North America or 8 MHz in Europe. And by combining a suitable set of channels to be used upstream from the customer and downstream from the node, each customer can be provided with sufficient data bandwidth to carry both their TV streams and broadband internet connections. DOCSIS 4 is an upgrade of the existing 3.1 spec that allows for greater upstream capacity and this is under serious trial and will be rolled out globally shortly. And the signaling formats and therefore the signal integrity requirements remain the same as for DOCSIS 
but the bandwidth required now extends up to 1.8 gigahertz. UHF is the band from 300 to 3000 megahertz or 3 gigahertz. If you transform a signal to an electromagnetic wave using an antenna, these signals have wavelengths from one meter to one tenth of a meter. And it also means that there are more sources of interference that can disrupt a signal and smaller features on a transmission line can affect those signals. Cables have to get shorter. Signal loss over any particular length of cable increases as frequency increases. Smaller features and points of damage can lead to troublesome interference and reflection. More on that later. Due to the rollout of the hybrid fibre coax networks, the length of copper coaxial cables in the network is reducing. This has been one of the key drivers for the acceptance of these new high bandwidth data services, overlaying analog or entirely replacing analog transmission of data and TV. Basically, shorter cables mean lower signal losses, allowing higher bandwidth signals to reach the customer. The role of trunk cables has been replaced by fiber optic links that have much greater overall capacity and improved reliability. This then leaves in the network the drop cables from the node to the customer and the customer's own indoor cabling. Drop cables are often susceptible to physical damage due to being at shallow depths across people's gardens or poorly protected basements. Indoor cables are a complete minefield of well-intentioned DIYers modifications and low quality accessories. So whilst the overall length of coaxial cable is generally reducing, which is good for reducing costs for maintenance, the new higher bandwidth protocols being carried over this cable is pushing the frequency bands ever higher. More is being asked of the existing cabling and small flaws and faults can have a significant effect. The first thing that you may hear from your valued customer is that their Wi-Fi is slow. To a customer service representative, this may trigger a whole heap of discussion with the customer trying to diagnose the Wi-Fi trouble, probably heading down a complete blind alley. It is critical to get to the root of any broadband trouble and diagnose the correct problem. Statistics and logs from the head end should record the actual throughputs achievable to each customer. And this diagnostic information is the first clue as to a potential cable trouble. Well, everything's physics, really. Cables are used for multitudinous purposes. Today, we're talking about electrical cables, providing either simple power delivery from the source to the load or transmission of high speed data for mission critical purposes. These cables can take several forms, single wires, parallel pairs, twisted pairs, coaxial, or even fiber optic. For power or signals to pass efficiently along an electrical cable, you need to optimize loss, connectivity, and impedance matching. Let's deal with each of these in the following slides. Signals on cables can be attenuated by several effects. Series resistance of conductors, parallel resistive loss due to poor insulation, high frequency losses due to series inductance and parallel capacitance, or dielectric losses. Signal integrity can be compromised by bad connections, which may be due to poorly fitting or worn parts, misassembly, damaged spring contacts, perhaps due to overheating or corrosion, or just the incorrect part selection, the wrong connector. It is important to understand the concept of impedance of a cable. Whilst at DC, 
The impedance of a cable for steady current is purely down to the simple resistances of the wires and conductivity, or preferably not, of the insulation between the wires. As soon as we start transmitting alternating current of any frequency, then things start to become more complex. Literally complex. Complex numbers start to become involved because things become what we call nonlinear. Whether at 50 or 60 hertz for power or 5 gigahertz for Wi-Fi, the same principles apply just on different scales. And we're not going to get right down into the details today. There are whole lecture series on electromagnetics that you would need to study to get a full understanding of why cables work the way they do. For today, we'll just present the high level facts about a few cable types. I'll link some reference material at the end for the geeks. Hopefully you're all familiar with the concept of what is a conductor, an object or material that allows the flow of electrical charge forming an electrical current in one or more directions. Conductors are commonly made from metals that have an abundance of free electrons that can conduct the effect of an applied electric field from one end to the other. Different metals have varying quantities of these free electrons and their resistivity varies as a result. Copper is one of the best conductors. Silver is slightly better but rarer and therefore more expensive and only used for special purposes. Aluminium isn't as conductive as copper and has other snags such as being softer and an insulating oxide layer that forms very readily. However, it is much lighter in weight and somewhat cheaper. Therefore, it's often used for larger conductors, such as overhead power cables, often reinforced with steel strengthening strands. Those of you who recently attended my cable tracing and locating webinar will realize that everything relates to the way that electric and magnetic fields behave in and around cables. It is because of the way these fields interact any and every cable, even ones that are made from zero resistance superconductors, will have an impedance and their insulators will likely have some dielectric losses. So a superconducting cable may have zero resistance, but will have an impedance and will have losses when carrying alternating current. There really is no such thing as a free lunch or a loss free cable. This is sometimes called the characteristic impedance, probably because the value of the impedance depends upon the characteristics of the cable. Whenever electrical charge flows, an electric current results. The effects of capacitance between insulated conductors and inductance along the conductors become relevant. Both these characteristics are dependent upon the geometry of the conductors and the types of the dielectric used as insulation. Now a thought experiment. What happens when you apply an electric field to a cable? How does energy reach the far end? Consider the seemingly simple case where we have a battery, a switch and a pair of conductors that disappear into the infinite distance. As there is no complete circuit, it is open at the far end, isn't it? Surely no current will flow when the switch is closed. However, any pair of conductors separated by an insulating medium creates capacitance between them. Even if the transmission line were to be manufactured from superconductors with zero series resistance, there is no way to avoid creating capacitance along the wire's lengths. Any and every pair of conductors that are separated by an insulating medium creates capacitance between those conductors. When the switch is closed, electric potential or voltage from the battery creates an electric field between those conductors. Energy is stored in that electric field and this storage of energy results in an opposition to change in voltage. The reaction 
of a capacitance against changes in voltage is described by the equation I equals C dE by dt, E for electric field or V for voltage, dV by dt. And this tells us that the current flowing will vary proportional to the rate of change of electric potential voltage against time. When the switch is closed, the capacitance between those conductors will react against the sudden voltage increase by charging up and drawing current from the battery. The equation suggests that an instant rise, or zero time, in applied voltage via the magic switch will give rise to an infinite instantaneous charging current from the magic battery. However, the current drawn by a parallel pair of conductors or even superconductors will never be infinite because each of the wires creates series inductance. Remember that any current flowing or moving electrical charge or spinning electron develops a resulting magnetic field of proportional magnitude. Energy is stored in this magnetic field and the energy stored in the magnetic field results in an opposition to a change in the current. Each conductor develops a magnetic field as it carries charge from the source to charge the capacitance between the conductors. And in doing this, it drops the electrical potential according to the inductance equation, E equals L di by dt. So this voltage drop limits the rate of change of voltage across the distributed capacitance of the cable, preventing the current from ever approaching an infinite magnitude. Because the electric charge carriers in the two conductors transfer energy to and from each other at nearly the speed of light, more on that in a minute, the wavefront of voltage and current will propagate along the length of the cable at that same speed, resulting in the distributed capacitance progressively charging, whilst the rate of this is moderated by the inductance. We're not going to get into the weeds here. Let's just look at the results of a lot of analysis of geometry, electric and magnetic field theory. But consider the infinite cable case. The result is a constant current of limited magnitude from the battery through the closed switch. As the wires are infinitely long, the distributed capacitance will never fully charge to the source voltage. And the distributed inductance will never allow an unlimited charging current. As soon as the switch is closed, the pair of conductors will draw current from the battery as if it were a constant, purely resistive load. Conductors used like this are no longer simple wires, but form a transmission line. As a constant load, the transmission line's response to an applied voltage is purely resistive rather than reactive. Despite being comprised of purely inductance or capacitance, assuming superconducting wires of zero resistance. We say this as there is no difference from the battery's perspective between a simple resistor dissipating energy and an infinite transmission line absorbing the same energy. The impedance or of this line is in ohms and is called the characteristic impedance. And for a transmission line insulated by a vacuum or air is fixed entirely by the geometry of the two conductors. Where two wires are spaced a constant distance apart, the characteristic impedance is set purely by the distance between the two and each, other, each conductor's radius. Plus, we involve a constant called permittivity, and we'll talk more about that shortly, which is a constant set by the insulation between the conductors. So it's shown in this equation as K, but it's often shown as uh, epsilon R, epsilon subscript R, the relative permittivity. For a coaxial cable, the characteristic impedance depends on the ratio of the inside diameter of the shield on the outside to the outside diameter of the core. And again, the permittivity of the insulation between those conductors has nothing to do with the actual resistance of the shield or the core. Whilst wired or optical fiber communication is fast, sometimes it's just not fast enough. A good example these days is where financial institutions are reverting to point-to-point -point wireless links as they are faster than optical fibers. 
but why do signals travel more slowly in a cable? If the insulating material is something other than air or a vacuum, uh, they're both pretty much the same, both the characteristic impedance and the propagation velocity will be affected. And the ratio of a transmission line's true velocity of propagation in the speed of light in a vacuum is referred to as the velocity of propagation factor or VP or VOP. VOP is purely a factor of the insulating material's relative permittivity or dielectric constant defined as the ratio of the material's electric permittivity to that of a vacuum. And the factor can be calculated using the simple formula of VP equals one over root epsilon R, or the, 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 the relative permittivity. So the velocity of the cable divided by the speed of light. Whilst the equation for VOP factor shown above appears simple, in the real world, there are all sorts of complexities that can change the actual VOP measured. Many low loss cables utilize foam insulation or extruded spacers. And whilst in manufacturing, they aim to have a constant density, even small variations will result in a corresponding change of velocity factor and characteristic impedance. Water contamination can give very pronounced changes in both impedance and slowing of velocity of propagation. You can see from the equations presented for the calculation of the characteristic impedance of pairs of conductors and for coaxial cables that the line's impedance, we call it Z0, increases as the conductor spacing increases. If the conductors are moved away from each other, the distributed capacitance will decrease. Wider spacing between the plates of the capacitor. Plus, distributed inductance will increase as there will be less cancellation of the two opposing magnetic fields. Less parallel capacitance and more series inductance results in a smaller current drawn into the cable for any given voltage, i.e. A greater impedance. Okay, why might impedance change and what happens when it does? So we've covered the impedance depends on the geometry and the permittivity and maybe the conductivity if there's a series problem. Whenever you have a wave propagating through a medium, it will continue to travel unimpeded whilst that medium is constant. This applies to waves on the sea, sound in the air, earthquakes through the planet, and in our case, electromagnetic waves propagating along a cable. As with most physics, when you get to the bottom of things, the equations are also the same. Whenever there is a change of impedance, some energy will be reflected, but how much? Well, that depends upon the relative change of impedance. Earlier, we saw that the impedance of a cable can change for many reasons. Mechanical distortion, change of the dielectric, or series resistance, perhaps due to corrosion. What we show here is an equation for gamma, the reflection coefficient, which is zero for perfect matching and increases towards one as ZL, the load impedance, tends towards zero, a short, or infinity, an open circuit. Sometimes people prefer to express the reflection coefficient as a percentage. Sometimes these are easier to understand where 0 0.05 is represented by 5% signal return loss or reflection. Just multiply gamma by 100. Most commonly in the realm of time domain reflectometry, TDR, we tend to concern ourselves with the relative loss of power that doesn't reach the destination because it's been reflected. The equation for return loss, as we call it, RL, gives larger positive values for low reflection, tending to infinity for a perfect match and tends to zero as the reflected energy approaches 100% of the incident wave energy, the short circuit or open circuit. And we use the log function to generate that. And it's expressed in decibels. 
So, more about a TDR. We just mentioned time domain reflectometry in the earlier slides, but what is it and how does it work? What can it show and where does it fall down? Changes in impedance can be the sign that something is wrong with a transmission line. Send a signal into that line, expect to see nothing coming back as all the energy is delivered to the load. So how can we apply what we've already learned to identify where these faults may be present on a cable? We can transmit a signal into the transmission line and then watch for reflections. As we know the speed of light on the cable, set by its dielectric constant, we can then measure the distance to the fault as the time taken to fly to and from the event. Time of flight is two-way. The only thing to watch in this equation is how you measure time of flight. Because we're measuring energy traveling to and then returning to the launch point, be careful with the factor of two. Yes, cables do carry electromagnetic waves and the propagation of EM waves along them is ducted by the conductors. Antennas that you may find at the end of a cable or a waveguide are simply transformers that are coupling the feed at one impedance, usually 50 ohm and sometimes 75 ohms for RF applications, into the characteristic impedance of free space, which is 377 ohms. These radio waves in free space are photons, a convenient quantum of electromagnetic field. Just the same as light, but at a lower frequency. And when in free space and encountering an object, can be diffracted and reflected. TDR is related to radar, just without the rotating scanner. The concept is simple. A time domain reflectometer applies a signal to the cable under test and looks for reflections. If the cable's trace is good and uniform from start to finish and the end is terminated correctly, you will see virtually nothing. All the energy input to the transmission line is delivered to the load and dissipated there. Yes, you can build a basic TDR by hooking up a signal generator and an oscilloscope with some timing hardware and a line hybrid and matching network and get reasonable results on shorter lines. But things to consider are the transmission line losses and the levels of precision that you want to achieve. To optimize these, it's best to integrate the electronics so that the timing of the signal generator and the receiver are very closely aligned. Then you can also optimize the coupling of the outgoing and inbound signals through the line interface hybrid, the matching network. And the latter also becomes very important when you consider protecting the unit from accidental connection to inappropriate signals, such as AC power that can be found on some systems, such as CATV. It also becomes portable, even handheld. As with most things in life, people prefer A or B and become attached to their favorite, but usually things in reality are awfully similar. There are two fundamental types of TDR. Those that apply a solitary pulse to the line or those that apply a step function to the line. Even this subtlety has implications. No TDR applies just one pulse or step to the line to be tested. But what appears on the output screen looks like a single pulse or step, while in the background many are being sent and received, each with very slightly different timing to the last, and over a fraction of a second a detailed trace is built up from the returned information. Oliver Heaviside developed this function where the value is zero for all negative arguments and one for all positive arguments whilst developing a system to analyze telegraphic communications. Basically, this is a mathematical function called h of t, which moves its output level from zero to one instantly at some point in time and then stays there. In the real world, the signal cannot instantaneously jump from zero to one. There will be some practical limit of what we call the slew rate of the output amplifier and system. But as the rise time of the step approaches zero, the signal can be used to resolve smaller and smaller features on the cable under test. 
but then attenuation effects of the cable will absorb and dissipate a greater proportion of that high frequency energy, leaving only slower rising, lower frequency step energy to reach the distant parts of the cable. And these will, of course, be further attenuated on their way back to the receiver. The correct term for what we commonly call a pulse is an impulse. In the electronics world, you will often talk about the impulse response. Pulses are nice because they create visible traces upon which you can manually by eye or mechanically by digital correlation spot attenuated versions of the output pulse. Whereas when using a step, some events can be very subtle to see. There are pros and cons of each type of TDR signal. Like the rise time of the step, the width and by implication the rise and fall time of the impulse dictates the maximum frequency contained in the energy transmitted into the line. The narrower the pulse, the finer the possible resolution of nearby faults, but the smaller the total energy sent to the line. A true impulse function has a value of zero everywhere except at zero where its value is one. In the real world, it's impossible to have a pulse width of zero. And if you've ever done calculus, it should be easy to see that the unit impulse is the derivative of the heaviside step shown on the previous slide. The impulse response of any system is always the derivative of the H or step response. So these responses seen on the screen of a TDR are always interrelated. Step functions provide energy into the system for a longer time. Uh, in real life, they're not infinite, but really long square pulses, you just don't get to see the far end. And some believe this helps display more information about the condition of the cable at a distance. But in real terms, the amount of information returned from event is purely related to the amount of energy reflected that can be detected at the resolution you're interested in. So whether it's a narrow pulse that contains a very small amount of energy or a fast rising edge that is soon reduced to a slower rising edge by the step response of the cable itself, that limits the available high frequency energy available to resolve small features, whichever system you use. The two systems are pretty much interchangeable, though interpreting the traces can be different, of course. Tempo mainly produce pulse TDRs, and these will be the subject of the following slides. Our NC500 Netcap Pro uses automated step TDR for cable length measurement, and our Sidekick Plus telephony multimeter is available with an optional step TDR. It comes with a pulse TDR as standard. What I will present now are some example traces of what you will see in the real world when using one of our TDRs. Open circuit faults have a reflection coefficient of 1 and create pulses containing all the incident energy and which extend above the midline of the trace. A full short circuit has a reflection coefficient of 1 sending all the incident energy back to the source, but in the opposite polarity, the pulse extends below the midline of the trace. At default gain, this low impedance event, which I have simulated by using a 50 ohm BNC coupler between two sections of 75 ohm cable, can be seen even at the automatic gain level. When you zoom in on that event and increase the gain, you can see that this event first drops, indicating a low impedance, and then has a short excursion above the midline, suggesting a subsequent increase in impedance, exactly as you might expect from a mismatch coupler. What we can see here is the effect of damage to the shield of a cable. I cut away the sheath and broke most of the shield conductors. This then forms a variable fault where the cable impedance can be manipulated from normal to high as the shield conductors make and break continuity. Sections of cable like this are prime targets for ingress of noise, perhaps from cellular telephones or other nearby wireless devices. It's emphasized here on the trace by using what we call intermittent mode. So where a fault is variable, you can show that sort of blue and red pink area. Here, I've seriously bent the RG6U cable. What is happening is that the foam dielectric is being crushed, 
change in the impedance of the cable, making it lower. It will usually recover when straightened, but if it was left in that position for a long time, it could even short. Here we have a pair of correctly terminated cables coupled by a barrel connector. But even this can be seen if the rest of the cable is good and you turn the gain up a little bit. Let's try and put all this in a few key points. You don't need to remember the formulae that we presented here, but it's a good idea to remember that cables carry energy from one place to another by conducting the electric field from one end to the other. But that is moderated by the resulting magnetic field. Then we found that the characteristic impedance of the cable is defined by the geometry of the conductors and by the dielectric constant of the insulator. Again, we didn't delve into the exact derivation of where the formula came from, but the basic formula are presented. It's worth remembering that even if the cable were to be built using superconductors which have zero resistance, that the cable would still have the same characteristic impedance. Then we find that the insulator's dielectric constant is also responsible for setting the velocity factor of the cable. Now I'll summarize several of Tempo's products that can help you. We will send you all a copy of this presentation and you can follow the links to each product's web page, allowing you to get more details. Tempo's Cable Scout TDRs are primarily developed for use on 75 ohm coaxial TV cables. However, this does not prevent them from being used in many different applications, such as antenna feeds of 50 or 75 ohms, high specification twisted pairs such as Cat5 and higher LAN cables, and even leak detection wires embedded in steam pipe insulation. We've had them tested on many different types of cables. Tempo make various other testers for copper based cables that also include TDR technology as part of their functions. Sidekick Plus includes a pulse TDR as standard and has the option for a step TDR too, where greater precision is required, perhaps for testing structured cabling based on Cat5 and higher cables. Netcat Pro 2 is a multifunction structured cabling tester with additional LAN Ethernet test functions, such as service detection and speed rating and power over Ethernet detection, but uses step TDR to measure the length of a cable and spot wiring errors. A coaxial port is also provided for measuring CATV cables. Tempo offer a range of optical TDRs, sometimes abbreviated to OTDR. 930XC is suitable for technicians working in the trunk and distribution network. While the almost pocket size unit, the OFL100, is ideal for technicians working more often on the distribution side of fibre to the X networks that are currently being installed. Some call these last mile OTDRs, but Tempo's OFL can see far more than one mile, but has lower dynamic range than the larger device. On the next couple of slides, I'll present some links for some further reading if you want to delve deeper into this. These links provide a general background, and the last one has some great animations that may help you understand a lot about electricity and magnetism. I recently discovered this YouTube channel by Kathy Joseph, who has a great knack of being able to explain really complex concepts using language that I hope most people can understand. She also has a whole series about how one thing led to another in the discovery of electricity and magnetism. We'll pause now to answer the questions that you've raised on the chat. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, now's the time to leave some in the chat. Um, Mark, I have one uh, question here for you already is, can I spot the change of a cable type, same impedance, but different type using the TDR? Okay. Um, so same impedance, but a different sort of brand or grade of cable. Um, no, <laughs> if they're, if they're, um, if they're perfectly terminated and they're both say 75 ohms or both 50 ohm antenna cables, then there's no change of impedance at that joint. Um, so in the ideal world, no, you won't see it. You won't see anything. But as I showed in one of the examples, um, can I bring something up here? Uh, 
I haven't got one right in front of me, but if, if you had um, two pieces of um, RG6 coupled together um, with a very good connector, then very good means you won't see it. And it, and it's also not relevant because there's no there's no there's no problem. Um, the, so I, I know there's there's a desire sometimes perhaps you you've got a drop cable going into some some other cable, and you want to find out where that um, transition happens. If it's done very well, unfortunately you're gonna you're gonna struggle. It's not it's something that TDR or any other device um, pretty much can't can't show because the the impedance is not changed. There is no there's no reflection. There's no signal loss. Yeah, it's good. Great. Um, give you guys a few more. Oh, we have one. What length of dead zone cable you suggest could be used on the TDR? Uh, oh, I, by dead zone cable, you sort of mean a launch cable. Um, obviously on optical TDRs because of certain constraints they they're often in the in the range of hundreds of meters um but on this TDR for instance if I pick up our 220 the new one um you can measure literally from here um now of course for any particular event um when you see a, a pulse if you if you're sending out a 1 nanosecond pulse you can't see anything within 1 nanosecond on a cable, which is about a foot on typical cables. So if there are two events within one foot, you you will see just one one lump of event return. If if those things are say three feet apart, you'll see two blips um, at the fastest setting on this. But um, so the dead zone in terms of where you can test on the TDR itself is there on ours. Um, on on others, it can be uh, it can be different. Um, one more for you. How small of an impedance change is detectable? Uh -huh. Yeah, always the good question. Right, so I, I always give my usual answer. It depends. <laughs> depends on a lot of things. So if 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 the impedance change is literally here, then there's very much uh, or, or pretty close to the TDR. So within say 100 meters or, or uh, 300 feet, maybe even a thousand feet, um, there's not that much attenuation in the cable. So it's all down to how much reflection you get versus how much attenuation you then get on the signal coming back. So, so the actual amount of reflection depends on the difference of impedance. I would say a half an ohm at a reasonable distance. I mean, because the networks are getting shorter in terms of what is used in copper, because um, the fiber to the X is the X is getting closer to the customer. Say you've got less than a thousand feet, three hundred meters of of cable, then I would say that you're probably a, a fraction of an ohm um, in terms of half an ohm to be the smallest thing you're going to spot. Now consider half an ohm. It sounds like something that's significant, but when you actually look at the spec of most of the cables that you buy, they actually have a tolerance of plus or minus two ohms. So you could actually have one seventy-five ohm cable from one batch and one from a different batch, and they connect them together, and you see an event. And the reason that event's there. Is because the even if it's the same grade of cable from the same manufacturer, but they did it on a different date, just like paint colors, something changed. So the density of the foam is different, or the, the constitution of, of, of the of the of the of the dielectric is different. Therefore, you'll see up to two ohms difference. So, you know, half an ohm, I would say, is something you can probably see on shorter cables. As you go further out, it gets bigger. Great. Um, so it doesn't look like we have any more questions in the chat. If you do have a question, now's the time. Uh, but if there's no more questions, then we can go ahead and wrap up for today. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, we, you'll be receiving an email in your inbox with a link to this presentation. You'll be able to watch it in its entirety. Uh, you can also find that on our YouTube. That'll be up in about three to five business days. But uh, until then, we'll see you next time. Thank you guys so much for joining us. And thank you, Mark, for presenting today. No problem. Thanks. If anyone's got any questions, just email us. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Bye.